Greetings, it's good to see you. How are you all today? How many of you have an environmentalist friend who is not vegan? That is why I am giving this talk. All right, let me switch. switch over to my magic glasses where I can't see you, but hopefully can read. I don't know, I can't see anything no matter what I do these days. Can't let it bother you. All right, so um, the book Eating Earth is the book that this material comes most from. If you're interested in having it, it is a fairly inexpensive book. You can get it secondhand, I think, pretty cheaply. But Bite Back has it over uh, at their booth. And there's another one, Animals and Environment. So I have two books out that talk about these subjects if you're interested in them. And again, the importance of them is that we have information in our pockets to talk to our friends about uh, when it comes to being environmentalists and caring for animals at the same time. I tend to use the word animal. It's mostly a writing tool for me. I have been doing a lot of writing lately, and when I do that, I tend to switch it over into my speaking. So just so you understand when I say animal, I'm talking about uh, what others would say non-human animals, but I find that long and cumbersome, and I don't want to other, so I tend to use animal. I'm a moral philosopher. I know the importance of science. How can I decide what is right and best without information. I need information. So that's where science comes in. I can decide best what I ought to do when I have information at hand. So there's a lot of science in this talk. But here's the other half of it. The scientists need moral philosophers too. They aren't very interested in what I have to say, but if they paid attention to moral philosophers, they wouldn't be experimenting on animals. So they, they get away with a lot because of what laws allow, but really the two have to work together. Uh, moral philosophers put the brakes on science and, and keep them in line. So this is the first question that I would ask um, of, of an environmentalist who is non-vegan. Do environmentalists value natural habitat enough to change their diet? Well, they're going to need some information to make that decision. This statistic, the 70 and 60%, is key in this talk. You'll see it come up oftentimes. Cycling grains through herbivores wastes 90% of the energy that's in grains. So anytime you move through a trophic zone, so you've got the plants, then the herbivores, then you've got the carnivores, uh, no, sorry, then you've got the omnivores, and then the carnivores, and then sometimes they even divide them into the kind of mega carnivores. So when you move up one of those zones, you lose 90% of the energy. This means that if I give 20 pounds of grain to a cow, the cow will gain two pounds of body weight, of which one pound is edible. 42% of a cow's body is inedible. And then you see also on the screen there's other things that are wasted. Look at that calf running around on a sanctuary. Doesn't she look happy? She's burning up a lot of energy. Not wise to feed your grains to others first. Just eat them. So here we have a cow that was once or would have been exploited for dairy. And perhaps you'll recognize Joanne MacArthur too. So this happy cow, um, when lactating, will eat 25 kilograms or 56 pounds of grain every day. So talk about waste, when we feed 56 pounds of grain to one cow in one day, we're wasting a lot of grain. And you, when you think about what that would do in a human community. So for human beings, a lactating cow eats more grain in just eight days than one adult in India in an entire year. In a feedlot, a cow will eat uh, about a ton of grain. That can keep a family of five in India, alive for a year. So this is how you can see how wasteful it is to cycle grains through cattle. And of course, chickens, uh, chickens and pigs fit in here too. They, it is a waste to cycle your grains through any other living being. Just eat them directly. There's about 900 million people that are suffering from chronic hunger. And yet we feed 635 million tons of grain to farmed animals worldwide. 
This amount of grain could feed three billion people for a year, or everyone who is hungry, the chronically hungry, for th three times over you could feed them, feed them for a year. So with land, total energy input to output for animal agriculture is 35 to one. How many of you would put $35 into a machine and keep doing so when every time you only got a dollar out? Okay, we can go with euros. Right? It doesn't make any sense. Animal ag moving across trophic zones is so wasteful that it requires 60% more land to grow all that food to feed all those animals who give very little back for those who eat them. And we could then release 60% of our lands if we'd all go vegan. 60%. We could go back to wild lands. What a dream for environmentalists. For us too, of course. The next question would be climate change. Here is the number one problem that we suffer from, uh, the biggest environmental concern. It's a factor of population and consumption. How does our diet affect our climate change footprint? All right, so carbon, fossil fuels are the biggest contributor to carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is about 75% of our greenhouse gas emissions. It is, however, a weaker uh, emission than methane and nitrous oxide. So this, if, if you look just at the carbon dioxide, when you understand that 60 and 70 percent that goes into feed stocks, you recognize how much more fossil fuels are being burned than some will figure in. So sometimes you'll see figures for this that are a lot less, and what they've done is they often haven't figured in things like the feed crops that are raised and fed to the farmed animals. All right, so let's look at um, some of this. So remember this, that the 70 to 60%, remember that globally, fossil fuels are huge, and it's a very long and twisted journey from a wee plant seed to processed pepperoni, uh, especially if it's slathered with dairy. So that burns a lot of fossil fuels, and that's why it's important to figure in from the seed in the ground clear to the table of the non-vegans. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse grass, as is nitrous oxide. And the cud chewers produce 80% of this 40% methane that comes from animal agriculture. So manure and fossil fuels also create methane. But remember, and I, and I have this on the screen often, I won't say it often, but I had a friend who just hated, he was an environmentalist, he just hated the cattle. He cursed every time he saw them. He ate meat. So I just always want to remember that it isn't their fault. They could live quite peacefully and not hurt the earth if we didn't have them in such huge numbers. All right, so then some people think they will switch to grass-fed. Remember that more roughage, the more time that a being works to consume and the more time that a being is alive chewing and they have to live longer on grass-fed. Yes, their lives are better, and that's good, but they're still exploited, and they should not be born and raised for exploitation. And grass-fed is not better for the environment. It may make some people's consciences feel a little better, but it doesn't do anything for the environment. So environmentalists can't turn in this direction. Nitrous oxide, the third really strong greenhouse gas, also called laughing gas, is 96% uh, from farmed animals. That is a ton. And most of that comes from the chemical fertilizers, 80% of it, which of course is deadly for the earth in every imaginable way. So if we weren't raising that 60 or 70% um, of food for farmed animals, we wouldn't need all the chemical fertilizers. And of course then there's the manure and the fossil fuels used as well. And that's why Animal, animal agriculture is the number one contributor to, uh, to f greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a very important thing to think about. And the next time, it, it's important for us vegans to start asking non-vegan meat eaters where they're getting their protein. What about our water systems? Oil wars are, not, are gonna be over and our next wars are gonna be over water. How does a vegan diet protect the world's waters? Animal agriculture is deadly for fresh water. 90% of the depletion worldwide, worldwide is from animal agriculture, and the number one use of it is for those feed crops that we talked about, remembering that 70 and 60%. 
I created this graph, the big gulp, so you can see per individual, per day, per species, what the gulping looks like. And notice the dairy cow. Uh, environmentally, the dairy cow is quite implicated, but remember that it's because of her cruel exploitation. It's not her fault. Yes, yes, having dairy, uh, dairy farms is very hard on the environment. And notice the little chicken there is looking really innocent, but check this out. There's a lot more chickens than there are dairy cows. So when we put it all together and we look at both the food and the water, the food is the green and the water is the blue, you can see that the Amazon River flow annually is what a cow is consuming in fresh water. That's a lot of water. The Amazon carries one-fifth of the world's total river flow. It's 6,400 kilometers. That's 4,000 miles for those of us who are still in the Middle Ages. And during the wet season, some areas are 120 miles wide, or 190 kilometers. If we used only water from the Amazon to water farmed animals for one year, the river could not provide water for anything else for nearly four years. Okay, so that is the fresh water consumption of these farmed animals. It's extensive. And it doesn't even count cleaning dairies and cleaning slaughterhouses. When I was a teenager, back in the 14th century, I worked in a dairy for a while with my friend. She had the actual job. I just showed up and helped her. But we would blast the cattle with water. And it's what you do before you milk them. You're trying to clean the manure off of their udders. So then, before they put the suction cups on the udders, uh, there's that dripping, poopy water right up into the milk. Great stuff. Get your appetite going for dairy. So this water is obviously creating environmental problems, this type of water consumption. And obviously our aquifers and our rivers are suffering from it. And where I live, they're always diverting creeks and waters for cattle in Montana and Wyoming, the two states. My sister's in Wyoming and I'm in Montana. At my house, there's just a quarter mile from my house or less. There's a diverted water flow. It must be, I don't know, 15, 20 feet across, deeper, deep, well over my head, and swift, taken right out of the Yellowstone River. And it never goes back. It goes into fields, it waters cattle. Uh, and then when they empty it in the fall, all the fish, you see them dying, hundreds of them. I go out with buckets and try to get ones that I can back to the river. And at my sister's house, the same thing. There's a diverted water flow. It's not as large. Uh, and the neighbors that have cattle, they just run it out onto the fields. So this is why our rivers are running dry. You may not live in places where you actually see it. I see it. I know why those rivers are running dry. It's because we're diverting the water and running it out into the ranching areas. Any science, any sincere environmentalist concerned about fresh water, and that should be all the environmentalists, need to choose vegan. It's not only more colorful, healthier, and tastier, but it's also better for the environment. What about the pollution? All of these animals are busy consuming and they also uh, release wastage out the back. Pigs are the biggest poopers per pound, with one pig producing four times as much waste as one human. Cows are larger, so naturally they uh, poop even more, although not per pound. A cow in a dairy creates 67 liters of waste every day. That's 18 gallons for the primitive. So a farm of 2,500 lactating cows will equal the waste of a city of 411,000 people. And none of it goes through treatment plants. Sith Smithfield Farm, that's a pig farm, discharges 24 million tons of waste annually. Discharges where? They make it sound so sterile. Now, this is a feedlot under some mountains, and um, I would kind of like to ski in those mountains, except I can't ski. And anyway, that's a pile of poop. So this is what happens. This is how we get all this poop, right? You put a whole lot of cows in at one place, and what you get, you get piles of poop. And you can see the GHG, the greenhouse gas emissions, methane and nitrous oxide, as that poop decomposes. It comes into the air, and the poop washes into the streams. So here's the global herd's turds. So we'll go down now to the Hudson River, the annual flow. 
you can see that it cows, the cows, uh, the, the aggregate waste is equal to the Hudson River. Can you imagine going to the Hudson River, which is about 100 and 315 miles long, and seeing it just flowing with poop? If we ran one year of farmed animal poop from the world's farmed animals down the Hudson, nothing but poop would go down for four years. That's one year of poop. So we got a lot of poop. What do you do with it? Well, spread it around. What else can you do with it? And of course, the rain grabs that and takes it right into the streams. And what does that create? Dead zones. So the world has a lot of dead zones. And when I first started talking about this, very few people knew what dead zones were. But watch this. How many of you know what a dead zone is? Aha, uh -huh. see there? We're, we have to learn about these things because they've become so terrible. And when I, when I was first talking about this, there was only, I don't know, half the dead zones that there are now. There's about 500 now. It goes up exponentially, and you can see how it's climbing upward. So the poop gets out into the water. It's really rich in nutrients. So the algae blooms and grows and is rich and happy with all the poop. But then, of course, it gets crowded, and it doesn't get the light, and it starts to die, and the bacteria eat it up, and they eat up oxygen while they're eating up the algae bloom. And when they eat up the oxygen, you get a dead zone. Chicken poop is particularly concentrated in nitrogen and phosphorus, which are the, the, the chemicals that create the algae blooms. So um, in Facts for Fish Eaters, which I talked about in 2017, you can look up more about dead zones. Here, I'll just show you a couple pictures of them. Look at the glistening water. Isn't it beautiful? Too bad those are dead fish. But you can imagine. Here we have more glistening beaches. And I included a fish just so that we could remember that these are individuals. These millions of dead fish are individuals, like that one there that died because she couldn't breathe and like that happy catfish that still has enough oxygen. One other thing that we get from factory farms that environmentalists should be worried about is poisons. Because you, the, the monocultures, 60 to 70% of the grains we raise, for example, are particularly hard to keep uh, from being destroyed by so-called pests, the herbicides and um, pesticides that are poured on these are especially thick. Uh, pesticides and herbicides went up about 400% in the space of 50, 60 years as we started to do more monocultures. And of course, this washes into the water as well. So what's in our water? Well, a whole lot of things that probably not one of us wants to drink. And the thing is, we may find a way to survive the Earth's destroyed water systems. But what about this little citizen? What's she going to do? Did any of you have any woods to play in when you were younger? Any of you play in the woods? Yeah, OK, that's good. Did you climb trees? Build forts? Run around naked? <laughs> well, you never know. Forests are places of beauty and peace, such splendor and so full of life. And many environmentalists focus on protecting forest ecosystems. How does an, an omnivorous diet impact forests. Well, here's the Brazilian forest. We've heard about it going up in flames. 98% of the destruction in Brazil, and it's one of the ones with the most destruction, is for feed crops and grazing. So again, note the feed crops. And I know that as a tofu eater, I remember when my colleague said, you're a tofu eater. You're part of the destruction of those rainforests. I was like, ooh, really? So I went and looked it up, and of course, it's 80% feed crops. So I went right back, and you know what I said to them? It's you. Go vegan. <laughs> so again, when we look at something like this, it, you know, we know it's cleared for ice cream and cheeseburgers and chicken. And, and sometimes I need a reality check with a picture like this. Who lived here? Right? This was growing green, teeming with tropical life. Lizards, birds, frogs, insects, primates screaming in the night air. Where are they? The omnivores ate them. Every last one of them who lived here. This is a graveyard left by the forks and knives of omnivores. And for what? There is so much to eat. Rainforests hold more than half of the Earth's species. 
If we lose 90% of the rainforest, we lose, lose as much as 55% of the plants, of the planet's species. That's animals and plants. And of course, we also lose the last cultures that have escaped the power of the Industrial Revolution. When you ask an, am an omnivore what they had for lunch, please correct them if they don't mention the rainforest. They had a portion of the rainforest for lunch hidden in their meat, dairy, and eggs. Soils are essential for life. Without soils, no land, no plants. Without plants, no land for animals. So we have to have our soils. And 40% of the agricultural land is degraded. 73% of dry rangeland is degraded. So we're already in really bad shape. And notice here the 7%, only 7% of that degradation, which is turning our soils and our lands into deserts, only 7% of it is caused by anything other than the animal agriculture and agriculture more generally feeding uh, the animals. Omnivores are trashing land with their teeth. What about these citizens? What about protecting these folks? How does an omniv omnivorous environmentalist harm wildlife? Let me count the ways. So this part I've put in here for the fishers and the hunters and the omnivores as well. I want to talk about a thing called predator control. And what I understand is pretty much every country that has hunters and fishers has something similar. But I know the system best in my own primitive country, so um, I will focus on that. Anyone who thought they might avoid environmental degradation by hunting, how many of you know an environmentalist who thinks that hunting is a better idea? OK, I know them. I know them too. This portion is about that. All right, so the Wildlife Service budget, whenever you have hunters or fishers paying a government institution, it's the Wildlife Services in the United States, then that institution serves those hunters and fishers. So in this case, we have ranchers and farmers and hunters and fishers. All of their interests are being protected by wildlife services. So they spend 53% on what they call, or they used to call, they hide it more now, it used to be called predator control. It costs $10 billion to do this. So the idea is that predators will hurt calves or chickens. Statistics show it's extremely rare. But all they have to do is call wildlife services, and they will show up and trap, shoot, or poison whatever animal the farmer rancher says is hurting their profits, let's put it bluntly. And as far as hunters and fishers, hunters want ungulates. No fun going out hunting if you can't find something to kill. I mean, they say they're out there for the nature. Well, let's face it, they don't ever go out there unless it's hunting season, at least not the ones I know. So um, if it's for the nature, wouldn't they be out there all year round like I am? But I don't see them until hunting season. And fishers, same thing. Um, if you want fish, you've got to kill anything eating the fish. So uh, that's the interests that are being protected. So here's the predator control hit list, and these are just a handful from a very long list. Notice the sea lions so that you know that the fishing interests are also protected. God forbid anything, anybody eat a fish except a human being. Four million annually are killed. And here's some numbers. Can you keep an e ecosystem intact killing these numbers of specific predators? How is that possible? How can an environmentalist even imagine that this could be OK? All right, so close your eyes if you don't want to see a gross, some gross pictures. I try to protect us because as animal activists, we just don't need to see things anymore. We, we know what's going on. So I try to warn you, please close your eyes. The next, the next picture is a little hard to take. But this is what um, the Wildlife Services does. they largely trapping. And my dogs have all been caught in traps. It's around in Montana in particular. I see traps. So the suffering involved in trapping and poisoning is legendary. And of course, they also shoot from helicopters, which is just, it's just, there's no, right, fair chase, right? Can any sincere environmentalist knowingly support this with their food choices? I don't see how. Here's a, you know, how do you keep an ecosystem intact killing that many coyotes? Coyotes are just crap animals in Montana. Um, they're killed at will. And of course, 
they come back. They will come back. If you kill them, they will have more babies. That's how nature works. So they are able to employ trappers and hunters in our federal government. I get to pay for it every year. All right, so trapping is indiscriminate. So are poisons. When you put them out there, you don't know what you're going to catch or kill. And you sometimes get endangered animals. And environmentalists must know this. And sometimes you get someone's beloved pets. All right, it's safe to open your eyes, largely anyway. And we will look at ocean life. There's a couple more scenes, but they're not as bad as those. So I gave a talk at this conference in 2017 again with all these facts. So I'm just going to touch very briefly on the fishing because, as I say, it's so humans, right? They find out maybe they shouldn't be eating cows, so they decide they'll eat chickens, and they learn that chickens being a little hard on the environment, and they say, well, I'll go hunting. And then hunting turns out to be a bad idea, and they take out their fishing pole, and I'm like, for God's sake, get some good red beans, some black beans, some potatoes. There are things to eat. You don't have to go out there and, I mean, get real. What year is this? In case anyone is thinking of switching to fish, all right, so this is not the safe haven. So 90% of big sea predators are gone. Gone. Uh, they just are hard to find. They've been pretty well reduced. More than 80% of the fisheries are maxed out. Completely unsustainable. The thing about the sea is it's under the water. We can't see it. We don't know it. Many sea animals are washing ashore, starved to death. Why? Because the omnivores are eating the fish. They're eating the sea life. And it's not like a seal can choose to have a vegetable stir fry. They don't have a choice. That's their food. We gotta leave it alone. Leave the seas alone. On behalf of those eating animals uh, from the sea, fishers pull in 100 million tons of wildlife from the seas annually. Notice how they're measured in tons. Can't have individuals, they're just tons. And so there you have it, three to seven tons is one African elephant, so that's a whole lot of tons. And of course, there's a lot of fish at risk, and I've lived long enough to watch uh, the fish industry go from, you know, I think I remember when Pollock showed up on the shelves, never been heard of before. So you run out of one fish, you go find another. You go deeper in the seas, you go further out. Um, one way or another, we keep reducing the, the so-called stocks. Atlantic salmon are commercially extinct. There's only 1% of the cod in what Cape Cod is named after. 1% of the original cod left. Trawlers are the worst. Look at them just scoop life out of the oceans. Look at the weight of the dead, the numbers of the dead. So trawlers are the worst offenders. They kill, for, there's a thing called uh, by catch or by kill, and it's the unintended, right? When you throw a hook or a net in the water, it's like the trap. You never know what you're going to pull up. So uh, shrimp is the worst. It has one pound of so-called edible for 14 pounds. Whoops. And here you have it, the lovely beings that were unintentionally killed or caught. Nets, nets kill 6,000 seals, walruses, whales, and dolphins annually. They kill endangered and protected species, lots of turtles. The Pew Ocean Commission has said that our seas are in a state of silent collapse. And of course, it's not just the oceans. It's the same when you fish in the clear waters. I always find hooks when I'm out walking, and some of them get into animals, and what's she to do? Right? How is she going to survive or eat? She needs help. Uh, help escaping the claws of the fishers. So the best way to protect the earth is to go vegan. It is not possible to be an informed, sincere, non-vegan environmentalist. Okay, so you can be ignorant and sincere and still eat animals and be an environmentalist. Or you could be insincere and know all sorts of things and keep eating animal products. But it would be just like being an animal activist that's eating other animals. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. So if you're an environmentalist, if you care about this earth, you've got to make some changes. And by the way, there's five key reasons 
to think about rethinking our diets. I use the acronym AMORE because I'm old and can't remember anything, and it works great. So the A is for the animal suffering and premature death, just out of respect for life. The medical is because the five, the five major killers, at least four of them are linked directly to what we eat and the costs of medical care. Why is it that on insurance in my country, if you're a vegan, you don't get this wonderful reduction in your insurance costs, right? Because I'm not killing myself every time I sit down to eat. Then there's the oppression, the human rights, the fact that we're feeding millions of tons of grain to cows and chickens and pigs that don't want to be exploited while people go hungry. The fact that by buying those products, we make sure that people who would rather never see a slaughterhouse in their life have to go in there every day and spend all day killing animals. And then, of course, is the fact that there's reproductive exploitation going on, and who wants that? That can't be okay. So the oppression that goes on is completely unacceptable. We hardly ever talk about religions at this conference. But has anybody ever heard of a religion that doesn't teach compassion? That doesn't? Yeah, it's unheard of. They're really important. So anybody who aligns with any religion, it's a reason to go vegan. So the environment's just one of these reasons. And I don't know you, about you all, but they're enough for me. But anyone who needs something more than these little beings, well, perhaps the planet will do the trick. Thank you. <laughs>